Go ahead and kick off the policy committee roundtable. Uh, my name is Don Oberlander. I'm the policy chairman. And I want to say, first and foremost, thank you to uh, both Representative Gregory and Representative Schmidt for really coming up with a terrific lineup today. Uh, we, we started out earlier at, um, at the Altoona Curve ballpark had a great time touring there, asking questions, and then we came here to the Sheets uh, location and had an opportunity to tour there. Uh, we'll get into some other things uh, once we've had a moment to just introduce. So we'll go ahead and start over here to my right. Torin, if you wanna go ahead. Thank you, Representative Oberlander. I am uh, Torn Ecker. I represent the 193rd District, which is Adams and Cumberland County. So over closer to the eastern side of the state, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, happy. I, I'm a, a freshman legislator, so I appreciate these tours and these uh, business roundtables throughout the state of Pennsylvania because it gives some perspective uh, for, for us new legislators. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for both the curve and for Sheets for a great day so far. Good afternoon. Uh, Jim Struzzi representing the 62nd Legislative District, which is the basically the southern half of Indiana County. So not far from Altoona, obviously. You know, you guys know where that's at. Um, I'll just echo what Torrin said. Um, great morning with the curve. Took my, take my family there at least a couple times a year. Uh, as I was mentioning to Joe, I was a uh, previous Chamber of Commerce president, so I know Joe heard pretty well. Uh, it, it's always good to go to the curve games because you can have just as much fun as you can at PNC Park at half the price. And everybody likes a cheaper beer. So. Uh, and, and this this tour of, of the Sheets campus um, compound, I mean, it's been eye-opening. Um, so appreciate all that you do and look forward to hearing all of the uh, presenters today. So thank you. And I'm Representative Chris Dush. Uh, I represent uh, Jefferson County in the northern half of Indiana County. Uh, I'm a junior legislator, a le legislator, it's my third term. Uh, I've taken advantage of these tours over the years and also the opportunities to get to talk to the businesses and the people who uh, are employing our people, our constituents, and Sheets does that for a significant number of folks. In fact, you have one down here at the corporate headquarters, comes from my district. Uh, but. I want to thank you. The, the corporate culture that I'm seeing here is, is uh, something very unique for the area, and uh, I think you're a blessing to the folks here in Pennsylvania. I'm glad you didn't move to West Virginia. I'm looking forward to ask, asking some more questions. Well, if this is a junior legislator, I'm a junior junior legislator because I'm a, I'm a freshman too. I'm Lou Schmidt. I represent the 79th Legislative District. So if you live in the city of Altoona, or Logan Township, or Districts 2, 3, and 4 of Allegheny Township, you're my constituent. And I think Altoona and Blair County, I think it's one of the, one of the uh, best kept secrets in the state of Pennsylvania. And we just have some really, we have some really gems here in uh, this part of Pennsylvania, the ballpark certainly being one of them, and this facility being another one. And so I'm always glad to bring folks from Harrisburg here so they can see what we have um, in this area and also get to get to see a little bit and talk a little bit to the, uh, to the people that we have around here, because I think we just have great people in this area. Derek Martin, who is the general manager of the Curve, was remarking this morning on how helpful uh, and how close the community is here. And I think that uh, this is one of the best communities uh, in Pennsylvania, without question. And I'm, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I want to thank Representative Oberlander for bringing the Majority Policy Committee here today. And I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, I, I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I know you're not shy. So as we go through this program today, please feel free to the extent you can to participate, give us feedback. This is a chance. I mean, look, you've got eight to nine legislators sitting in front of you. It doesn't happen every day. So, you know, take your shot today because <laughs> we're all going to be here and we're all going to be able to listen to what you have to say. So thank you again, Donna, for bringing everybody here. And thank you also to my fellow representatives, I know some of whom have come really a, a great distance to be with us here today. So thank you very much. Uh, Jim Gregory, representative of the 80th District, I would echo a lot of uh, what uh, Lou had a chance to say. Uh, there are uh, no people in this room that are shy about asking questions. I'm pretty confident of that. And when we went through the list of folks that we thought we would like to have, uh, that's what we were looking for. Uh, we were looking for folks that would come and ask some tough questions so that we can 
help understand the problems that you face, whether it's in business or municipal government, maybe it's in the field of addiction. Uh, but we, we wanted to hear from you. We brought these folks together to help answer those questions as best we could, but uh, I, would, I would just also like to say how proud I am to be in the 80th district uh, right here in, in Claysburg, because there was a day where this might not have happened uh, not long ago, and to see the way this campus has developed is just astounding. And uh, to Derek, thank you very much for the tour. You know I could have given the tour myself, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, it was uh, really, really a good time. And I know that talking to the other legislators, they've been very pleased with what we had a chance to, uh, to show them. They're, they're very impressed with what we have to offer here in Blair County, the 80th and the 79th. And to my fellow legislator, uh, Schmidt, who sits next to me on the House floor, we're working together to do good things to represent Blair County. So thank you for the opportunity that you've given all of us uh, to be there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Barry Joswiak. I, get, I think I get the Long Distance Award. So I came from Reading, uh, Berks County. Um, when I heard we were coming out here, I thought, man, I got to come to this one because uh, I like baseball and I enjoyed Derek. Derek just eats and sleeps the game and knows all about it. He, I was very impressed with you today. And also um, the Sheets family. Um, you have several stores in Berks County and I'm, I'm really impressed how many family members are involved in a business because most families with, with family members don't survive. I mean, I think that's amazing. And I'm also very impressed at the risk your family has taken to provide over 20,000 jobs and sustain their families. Um, and also, when I walked around, I noticed how very clean this place is. That must be one of your number one priorities. Everything is spotless, and your employees all seem very, very happy to be working here. I didn't see anybody complaining. Everybody was smiling or waving at us, how you asking us how we're we doing. So you really have a, you can really have a good thing going here with, with you and your employees, and I'm sure uh, you take care of them, that's the bottom line. So um, the district I represent is the fifth district. It was an area, they moved it to Berks due to population changes. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Well, as Barry said, it was, uh, it was really a great day. My name is Bob Brooks. I'm from uh, Allegheny County and uh, the top of Westmoreland. Uh, I used to be one of the owners of the curve. Uh, it's great to see that uh, it's going uh, even better than when I was here. And uh, you know, it was really great. You keep hearing about how the internet isn't in our um, midsections, and you know, a business like this couldn't survive without the internet. So I'm glad to see uh, that a lot of this. We had a, a policy meeting in Indiana, and the section we were in didn't have the internet, and I think that's such an important thing, but uh, it's really a joy to be here, and thank you very much. I'm Jim Rigby, 71st District, uh, Cambria, Somerset Counties, and I don't know, I can't say much more than what the other gentlemen and ladies have already said. Uh, I do remember going to Sheets as a, as a young man when they first came to Johnstown over on Ash Street, another one on Village Street, and before the MTOs when you got the saran-wrapped ham sandwich. Um, those were good, and that was before they were 24 hours, too, by the way. Um, so I, I've been going to Sheets a very long time, and I hope that's not giving up my age, but uh, really enjoyed the tour today in the facility, same with the ballpark, uh, and look forward to coming back to both. Thank you. All right, very good, thank you. So you know who we all are. What we would like to do very briefly is to start in the back corner. If you just stand up, Give your name, who you're here representing, and we'll work our way this way, and we'll finish with Ryan. For a nonprofit that manages all the state and federal drug and alcohol funding. Eli Ace, Nexus Construction. I'm with ABC, Associate Builders and Contractors. I'm Joe Metzger. I'm Vice Chair of Love and Tax with uh, Supervisor. Eric Palmer, Executive Director, Greg Alchina for Technologies. Joe Hurt, President and CEO of Blair County Chamber of Commerce. Michelle Rudloff, Executive Director for the Health Policy Committee. Deb Hudson Lisi, um, Legislative Aid with Representative Gregory. Kelly Harlan, Legislative Aid for Representative Gregory. I'm Joe Harper, I'm also an aide for Representative Gregory. 
Joe Hartford, I'm the founder and president of Brecklemere. I'm also a township supervisor in Walker Township in Huntington County. Matt Pacifico, Mayor of City of Altoona. Uh, Sean McClanahan with McClanahan Corporation in Hollisburg. Uh, Dan Hoover, CEO of Rolling Spring Black Book Company, the parent company of Rolling Spring Water. Steve McKnight with the Altoona Blair County Development Corporation, the Economic Development Organization for Blair. Derek Martin, General Manager of Everybody's Hometown Team, the Altoona Curve. <laughs> Uh, Bill Ward with Ward Transport and Logistics. It's nice to see many of you. Um, not my connections, but my wife Judy, so it's good to see a lot of you. I'm glad you're here. Richard Fiore Jr., Lions Fiore Incorporated. We're a general contractor, and I'm also the chairman-elect of Blair County Chair Chamber. Uh, Matt Stuckey, Stuckey Automotive, um, president of that company. We have uh, three party dealerships here in Altoona. So, thanks for having me. Nick Ruffner, Public Relations Manager of Sheets. Ben Queer, Policy Analyst to the <coughs> Policy Committee. Uh, Jennifer Keaton, Communications Coordinator for the Policy Committee. Gary Zimmerman, I'm here with Jim Gregory too. <laughs> <laughs> Vice President of General Counsel here at Sheets. Thank you, and I'm Ryan Sheets, AVP of Brain Strategies at Sheets. Good. Ryan, if you wouldn't mind coming to the table and pushing the button to make sure that we can all hear you. And uh, as you're getting settled, I just want to personally say thank you for your warm hospitality. Uh, for all of us today, we've had a great visit. Uh, Earl did a terrific job, and so did all the rest of your staff. And thank you again for um, allowing us to be here, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, certainly on behalf of my larger Sheets family, uh, I want to welcome everybody to our newest facility, and uh, I am so thrilled to, to be able to host everyone. And uh, thank you so much for all the compliments and commentary that's been shared so far. We're obviously very proud of what we have going on today. And you guys hit on a couple of facts and concepts that I would just kind of like to emphasize a little bit. Um, but yes, uh, certainly welcome to our, our Operations Support Center. You know, looking around the room, I certainly see some familiar faces. Uh, of course, ABCD Corp and uh, the Blair County Chamber of Commerce have been essential partners of Sheets over the years. And it's great to see folks like Steve McKnight and Joe Hurd here today. I'm also glad to see some of our local officials here in Blair County. So welcome to Altoona Mayor Matt Pacifico and Logan Township Supervisor Joe Metzger. Of course, many local businesses are also here today, as you just heard. Glad to see uh, my personal friend, Mr. Matt Stuckey from Stuckey Buick GMC. Folks uh, from, uh, I believe, Immler's Poultry was mentioned, uh, Durban Companies, SP McCarl, and Reclamere. Uh, all welcome to Sheets, and I want to thank you, in particular, Representative Oberlander for, uh, and your staff for organizing today's tour and this lovely roundtable uh, discussion. And we, of course, have representatives from all across the state, um, but uh, absolutely some uh, hometown heroes here, you know, Blair County's own Jim Gregory and Lou Schmidt. Uh, if I could just take a moment to pause and thank, personally thank Jim Gregory. He was kind enough to offer Mr. Earl Springer a citation before we got started here. Uh, Earl was, of course, uh, instrumental in your tours today, uh, but he's also had a very decorated Sheets career, and he'll be mad at me for saying this, but he has worked at this company as long as I have been alive. <laughs> and, uh, of course, his, uh, his, he's, he's famous for a lot of things, including uh, the ability to have a great radio voice. He tells people he has a face for radio. I think it's more of a voice for radio. Um, but Earl is uh, certainly a, a, a treasure here at Sheets, and he deserves to be celebrated. And just personally, I want to thank you for, for making him feel special in his uh, uh, upcoming retirement. Uh, and of course, you know, other uh, representative, got to acknowledge Jim Rigby here from just over the hill, Cambria and Somerset County. So welcome to everybody. Again, we are happy to, to host you. Uh, and before I do uh, jump into the roundtable discussion, I did want to take just a few more moments to comment on a little bit more about the details and, and of Sheets and how we do what we do here. You know, certainly as an industry industry leading convenience retailer, we have seen our fair share of success. But as a family owned and operated company, I would rather talk about something a little bit more personal to us. I'd like to talk about our values and, in particular, our family values. You know, a big reason for our success is obviously our people, and our people um, are our corporate culture. And again, thank you for the commentary that you've shared so far. I'm glad you guys are experiencing all the nice things that we have going on here. But you know, the most important point in all of that is the fact that we really do think of everyone who works at Sheets as a part of the broader Sheets family. 
You know, it was my Uncle Bob who started this company back in 1952 with one store uh, in Altoona. And since then, as a result of our people, we have grown to some pretty formidable sizes. I think it was already mentioned, we're coming up on 600 stores across six states. And the larger Sheets family is now well over 20,000 people strong. Half of those are Pennsylvanians. So obviously you don't reach achievements like that by simply thinking of your employees as family. We work very, very hard to treat our employees as family as well, and we work hard to put our money where our mouth is. So that's why we take tremendous pride in being one of the top places to work in the entire country. So hopefully you've seen, um, but obviously Fortune Magazine's top 100 best places to work, that is the shiny, uh, the, the biggest, shiniest accolade uh, along this topic, but it's not the only one. Uh, we are on that list five years and running, but you know we're also a, a best place for millennials to work, a best place for new graduates, a best place for women, a top 10 retailer in the country, and the, the list goes on and on. And you know I can stand up here and brag about this stuff all day because I had very little to do with us achieving those, those accolades. Uh, I think most of you probably know, but those are all objective third-party anonymous surveys. Frankly, at times, we don't even know that these companies are talking to our employees. They're contacting them and they're asking, hey, you know, we hear some good things, but tell us what it's really like to work at Sheets. And I'm just so proud that our employees on their own volition come out and say, hey, you know what, this is a great company. I love working here. And that is why I love bragging about those accolades uh, so much. And I think even further, just to cement the point, I'm so proud to work at a company where being a great place to work is as important as hitting our financial goals. And here at Sheets, it's not acceptable to have one without the, other, without the other, and I think that is absolutely a hallmark characteristic of our corporate culture here. And you know, I will, uh, I'll let you know a little secret. Yes, we do all this stuff because we believe, we know that happy people make great food and deliver great service. But again, back to where I started, our values, we do this because we know it's the right thing to do. We take care of our people because it's our obligation, it's our honor, and again, it is the right thing to do. So back to today, uh, we have so many people in this room to thank for their help and their partnership over the years. Uh, they're definitely a part of our success, and I'm excited to join the discussion about how we can bring more partnership, more collaboration, and more success, not just to the region, but to, to the state as a whole. Again, thank you for taking time to participate in today's discussion and tour. With that, I'll hand it back over to Representative Oberlander. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So we really do want this to be interactive. Um, so if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to come up here to the microphones. And um, I wanna just kind of give you a bit of an idea of why we are holding such things. So it started in uh, January of 2019. I became the policy chairman, our caucus wanted to lead the way on uh, good jobs for PA. So we know that Pennsylvania is a great place to live, work, and play, and we wanted to find out what could we do to make it better. And as part of that, we were in places like Philadelphia, where we met with a WISTAR, which is a research institution, and their relationship with uh, the Community College of Philadelphia. We were in Williamsport, where we worked with Lycoming Engines and uh, Penn, Penn College. We were in places like Lehigh, where we worked with the Ben Franklin Corporation and um, entrepreneurs who had uh, their businesses grow, flourish, and um, go to the next level. We've been to many places, uh, I think over 30 in things that we've had so far since the beginning of the year. It's an opportunity. We were in, um, we were in Clint Outlet's district, which was way up there by the border of New York. And we've been all over the place because we want to hear from you. So to, to Lou Schmidt's point of you have nine legislators here who want to hear your thoughts, concerns, challenges, and opportunities, this is your chance. I know that we had sent out a survey and that we had learned some information about what, what you would like to discuss. Um, I know that, as I said, we started the beginning of the year with Good Jobs for PA. We've made some changes, for example, career and technical education opportunities to help you match the need that we heard from you. You can't find employees. How do we help you make that match? Uh, so we've made some changes. Now into the fall session, we want to find out, are those working? 
if they're not working, what are some other things that we can do to help you? And so with that, uh, if I'm gonna kind of kick it off. If you wanna ask questions or have a conversation, please feel free, and then we're gonna go back and forth, okay? So when you come up, if you could please again uh, introduce yourself and uh, state your question or, or your concern, that would be terrific. Hi, uh, Bill Ward. Um, probably the number one thing that's on my mind that keeps me up at night, um, besides, as many of you know, my wife coming in late from some dinner, but, <laughs> but really is the thought of uh, legalizing the recreational marijuana. And um, I'm in the trucking industry, and we are controlled by the DOT. So even if it is legalized for all our employees, you know, they, they can't. So it really puts us in a bad situation. So. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Does anybody want to make a comment about that? Uh, I'll just say that I just saw that leadership, I think, issued a statement that said there was absolutely no interest in the Republican caucus in legalizing recreational marijuana. So that's the, that's the latest word. I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. So we're, I guess, since leadership's been mentioned, <laughs> um, I would just say that, number one, Recreational marijuana is not a priority that the Republican caucus has. We personally don't believe that, I personally don't believe that we have our arms around medical marijuana, let alone recreational marijuana. I will tell you that in some of the, the meetings and the tours that we've already participated in, including the Pittsburgh area with the trade unions, their very position is your position. It's still illegal for us. So if you are the employer and it is not acceptable to you, it doesn't matter whether it's legal or not. And they're having a real challenge in trying to match what perception is, because I think that when the governor comes out and says, and the lieutenant governor says, it's okay, recreational marijuana is no big deal, people start to think, well, what's the big deal? It's a big deal. So um, I would suggest that we, we think it is a big deal and that it leads to a lot of um, consequences that are not, not good for our state. So I appreciate your position on that and we'll continue to uh, work hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Great. Thank you. Anybody else before we... And when the Attorney General of the state comes out and says it's okay, I mean, that's really what kind of a signal does that send? statewide and you talk about the top law enforcement uh, official in the state of Pennsylvania saying that yeah he backs recreational marijuana and so I I just think that sends the wrong message we're gonna move to Tor and Ecker and then so so to your point uh, you know to the DOT regulations and OSHA regulations all those things uh, apply obviously because it's a federal uh, you know I think people forget a lot of times that uh, marijuana is still a controlled uh, you know, substance under the under the FDA. So, uh, you know, all these all, we have a workforce problem already. And I know the one thing I hear from people back home in Adams and Cumberland County is we want someone to show up on time and pass a drug test. And we're just going to exacerbate that problem by by legalizing it. So I think, you know, aside from the, you know, the quote unquote benefits of, of legalizing, I think what's being missed here is the fact that uh, there's a lot of unintended consequences that I think people aren't considering, and, and, and workforce is one of them. Representative Joswiak. Thank you, Jim, Mr. Chair. One. Um, Bill, good to see you. See you. Uh, I guess I'll tell you what we can do. Uh, right now, in Pennsylvania, people that get caught with small possessions of marijuana pay fines. Nobody goes to jail. So I have a bill in to take the, uh, the crime of a small possession, which is one ounce or less, um, to move it from a general misdemeanor, which is a misdemeanor three, which is the lowest misdemeanor, to a summary violation, to move it from the Court of Common Pleas to the district justice level. Now here's why we, we, I put that bill in. The district attorney in Brooks County um, asked me to put this in. Our courts are overloaded with these cases. Last year in Pennsylvania, it cost almost $40 million to prosecute people for small possession of marijuana for $2 million in fines. Now, there's, the justice system doesn't try to make a profit. That's not what it's there for. But when it's costing the taxpayers $40 million 
to prosecute for somebody who's just going to go pay a fine. Let's move it to the district court. Let them pay the fine right there. We don't need to tie the courts up. It keeps the police out on the street. And by the way, that's where the biggest savings will be in, this, in the uh, police departments because most of those guys go to court on their days off. So it's minimum overtime for them. Also, the, uh, the uh, people that I'm hearing from mostly wanting to legalize it, and by the way, I'm not in favor of legalization. Uh, the, one I'm, the one I'm hearing from are people from the city of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Now, I am hearing it from people in, in Reading and Berks County as well, uh, but it seems like the, the people from the major cities are really the ones pushing this. Um, I've told them, hey, I'm okay with moving it to a summary. I'm, I'm okay doing that, but not to legalize it. And actually, we've had people in, in Harrisburg from Colorado that came and talked to us about the, what happened when they legalized it. And some of the, some of the result was the unemployment rate went up. People don't want to work. There was more car accidents. I asked the question, is there more cars? Is there more people? And they said yes. I said, well, there's going to be more car accidents, but there are more driving under the influence charges. One of the big problems you have with it as well is when, when, you, uh, when you get charged with driving under the influence of alcohol, you, they can tell you how much alcohol is in your system. You can't with drugs. It tells you you have a drug and that's it. So marijuana stays in your system 30 days. It doesn't go away after a couple of days like an opioid does. So I think the solution for taxpayers is to move it to, the, to a summary, let the people pay their fine. Nobody goes to jail, go on their merry way. Um, I can tell you this, I was in a hearing with some senators and, and members of the House where they wanted to legalize it and they had a couple doctors there. And I, I, I gotta tell you, I'm the only one that was against it. I mean, they, everybody says, oh, I can vote for this. They came to me, I said, used to give you five minutes to talk. I said, how much time do I have? And the chairman of the committee said, well, how much do you need? I said, oh, I got a whole lot of questions. <laughs> and uh, I asked the doctors, I said, what kind of doctor are you? He said, I'm a psychiatrist. I said, the next one was a doctor of pharmacist. Then there was a, there was a woman uh, from Philadelphia who was women for legalization of cannabis or something. I forget what her title was. She's telling me everybody goes to jail. I said, nobody goes to jail. I had an eruptor because they're putting out false information. Uh, it was a good meeting, and the funny part about it, I had to leave to go to another, to another meeting, and a voting meeting, and all the panel ran out to talk to me because they want me to join their panel and work with them to, to legalize it, and I said, guys, I'm not on your side on this one. So that, that's my position, but just thought I'd mention those couple of things. So thank you, Donna. Representative Brooks. So probably, probably many of you have heard the breathalyzer by Pitt that's been uh, into the final stages, it's probably small, nice size like this, that's going to be able to give the police what they want. There's a Canadian company that uh, has a breathalyzer. It takes up the whole trunk of a car. That kind of a, a device is not going to make it, but this device uh, that Pitt has will be, and it'll give the opportunity for people to know whether it's current or uh, it passed. I believe that, uh, again, I hear it all the time in Allegheny, uh, and uh, I believe in, in probably two years, it'll become legal. Uh, I'm not for it, but you know, it's, you can see pretty much uh, the other party is, and it won't take that many votes to make it legal. So I'm sure within the next two years, it'll become legal. Uh, and I'm just glad to see we're handling these things like breathalyzers to be able to give the tools to the police. Representative Dash. Yeah, just a quick thing off of uh, what Representative Brooks said. I tend to believe that it won't happen in the next two years simply because the only places it's been passed is where they've had referendums. The states that do not have referendums, that have a Repu more Republican form of government rather than the total democracy, uh, they, it has not passed. We are still, basically, we protect the Republican form of government here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, secondly, one of the biggest things for industry is workers' compensation rates in the states where they've uh, legalized it, it's gone up, as well as it's even more difficult to find workers who will show up every single day. Those are some very key 
uh, issues when people are leaving the state of Colorado with manufacturing industries because they can't afford the workers' comp rates any longer. That's a pretty good indication that it's their implications or consequences to what they're doing out there, and we don't want that in Pennsylvania. And I'll be brief. The uh, the smile that came across my face, Bill, when I saw that the House leadership was not going to entertain this thought, I can't tell you that it was a big smile. Uh, this is something I believe strongly in that we should not pass. You can hire 30 or 40 truckers right now. Uh, can you find them? Can you find people that are going to pass that all-important drug test? In many cases, you cannot. And there are people in this room that will say the same thing. And this is just not going to help that problem that we have when it comes to workforce. And so uh, one thing I've learned on the House floor and, and sitting next to Lou and some of the veterans that sit around us is that the minority gets its say and the majority gets its way. And I hope I'm always in the majority when it comes to subjects like this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anybody else? Go ahead. And the other thing I want to I want to speak to is that lately we're hearing about these vaping issues, and there's there's some kind of a pneumonia that people who are vaping are are getting, and some people are getting very sick, and some people are dying. And from what I from what I understand, most of these cases where they're developing this vaping pneumonia condition involve the vaping of THC. So it's not something that comes without significant risk. And if you look at if you look at what's going on in Colorado, they have an increase in automobile accidents. Uh, the notion that you can't overdose on marijuana is totally false, uh, especially when people use edibles. Um, so you've got emergency room visits in Colorado have skyrocketed because of people overdosing on uh, marijuana, especially edibles. You've got an increase in domestic abuse cases uh, in, in Colorado. Now, can all of this be linked hand-in-hand uh, hand with uh, the legalization of uh, recreational marijuana? No, but there's certainly, I think, an effect there. So this is something we have to approach from a public health standpoint as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, serious issue. And people think we can just legalize it, it'll be fine. Colorado did it, California did it. Uh, that's not true. There are all kind of, of, of serious implications that come with legalizing a drug. And by the way, this is not your grandfather's marijuana. I mean, this stuff has a THC level that is, that is significantly higher than the stuff, you know, you, 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 this isn't people sitting around listening to the White Album, okay, smoking that stuff. This is, this is powerful, powerful stuff. It's psychotropic. Uh, it, uh, it, it puts people into a, practically a coma. And so we have to be really, really careful with this issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Any other issues? I know that somebody wants to talk. Come on. I know that we've talked about... Um, on the survey, we had some issues like regulatory reform. Thank you, sir. Yeah, hi, uh, Matt Stuckey again. So mine's maybe not quite exactly in your domain, but I think maybe you guys can hopefully help influence this. So I'm a past chair of Joe Hurd's Public Policy Committee. And one of the things that we've been talking about for years and have pretty much spun our wheels on for years, maybe made a little improvement, we at least have made some improvements in the communication side, but uh, it would be the, the just the the burden of municipalities that we have in Pennsylvania. So uh, Blair County has 25 municipalities, which are townships, boroughs, and city. Um, and then we have seven school districts, and we have water authorities and you know sewer authorities and those kind of things. So there's upwards of 50 entities. Um, and they all kind of have, you know, run their own little thing. And uh, as a business owner who's in about four of them now, I think, or five, I'm losing track, it just doesn't work well. <laughs> um, and they don't want to, you know, they're not going to get together on their own. So we need some kind of a push further up, um, you know, to, to tr help to get these to consolidate. I mean, that's going to be the only effective solution long term. Um, so we locally have some ideas on how we think we may work towards influencing some of them kind of organically to, to start that direction. There's obviously budgetary pressures that are going to make it, you know, with see what's going on with the school district of Harrisburg. Uh, you know, by not their choice, you know, it would be best for us to avoid that. So I didn't know what, if anything, is on the, you know, the state legislatures, legis legislature's radar as far as that goes, but uh, that's my question. <laughs> wow, that's a heavy one. Um, so I'll, I'll take a quick stab at it and then... We I'll actually have less over. than Cambria, like a lot. <laughs> it's worse over there from what I'm told. <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely have, I mean, we're a commonwealth and we have a lot of townships, we have a lot of uh, school districts and 
what we have found is that we support local decisions and local driven decisions, uh, th but that the state would, when two entities want to merge, for example, two school districts, and it doesn't happen very often, but when they want to, we are more than happy to help support that effort. And I, I'm thinking about Monaca and Beaver, Town, Beaver County, where they needed new uniforms for the band and they needed you know, the different mm -hmm. textbooks and things like that, or an easing of the, the different tax rates of those two school districts, then the state is really in a position to help help make that happen. Um, but I don't believe that we have any legislation, and, and correct me if you guys can recall of any, that would force uh, potential mergers. And, and I can tell you that I have a township that literally has 24 registered voters. We have, 24. One, we have a borough that has, how many is in Newry, Jim? It's less, it's like in that neighborhood. Newry Borough is oh about goodness. that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so we probably have 56 <laughs> individuals and half of them are voting. But, <laughs> but it, is, it is very challenging and, yeah. and for whatever reason they choose not to move well, in that direction. Yeah, there's lots of reasons and some of that's just kind of that's the way it was. Okay. I guess a lot of that ties into the pension, right? Most all these places are trying to do a pension for all the folks that work for them. And yeah. Legacy is good. Yeah, yeah. And, and Matt, just to add to the conversation to try and keep it going is that, you know, one of the things that we're dealing with is when you talk about the pension is a lot of municipalities are getting rid of their police forces because they can't sure. afford that pension. Mm -hmm. uh, so state police budgets have gone up as a result. So there's lots of little uh, anecdotal situations that are taking place that lend itself to continuing that, that conversation for us to look at. And I can tell you that when I'm out with the, the, the folks from the municipalities that I represent talking to them, a good one is Houston Township, Catherine Township, and Woodbury. Uh, they they yeah, a lot are of very work together small. Pretty well. They work together yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, but so what's the what's the what's the last barrier to get them over that that opportunity yeah, to right. look at consolidation? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Just thought I'd ask. Well, it's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. I can tell you, there's a municipality I'm going to be meeting with that's part of what my school district is, which is Ferndale, mm -hmm. which is kind of unique. It's made up of five municipalities and not one of them adjoin hmm. another one. Um, and they're looking and they want to break it up and get out and they're asking uh, for some information. I'm trying to find out the background. They want to go the other way. They, they want to disperse the, the, look, Ferndale graduated 48 students last oh, year. Oh, they split some of another districts. Um, yeah. they, they have a, an elementary school that's not even in their district. It's in Westmont, so yeah. you want to talk about screwed up. Yeah. Um, so I know what you're what you're feeling, but I, I believe that belongs on the local level. Yeah. That's why we elect local officials. Uh, they've got to make that choice. I hate anything that's state mandated that comes in where the state says you've got to do this. But when I look at the seven districts that are within my 71st district, taking a school like Ferndale that graduates 48 that has a superintendent that makes 136,000, it's kind of hard to justify. Mm -hmm. And so I think. One of the townships, one of the municipalities is thinking if they can get out of Ferndale and even go to another school where it might bring their taxes down. And so we're hmm. trying to get numbers together for them. I don't even know what the possibilities are. I think the original agreement in that district was that all five had to agree to disperse. Now, whether that's the. F it's just the really hard to get all those people together. I mean, you know, we have a project going on in a building we bought last year that's in three municipalities right now. And I've actually got them all to work together, but it's, I mean, it's been. Not only a lot of time, but a lot of expense to hire enough lawyers and engineers to get them to all talk, you know. <laughs> Representative Dush. Yeah, one of the first things that I uh, heard when I came into the legislature what, was that the hardest thing t in Pennsylvania to kill is a mascot. Mm -hmm. That Trying to get schools to uh, consolidate, uh, people don't want to give up that legacy. And... Uh, we run against up against some of that stuff too. Uh, I have a borough, Timlin borough, that's uh, in fairly dire position right now, and uh, they want to merge back into the township from which they uh, originally uh, sprung. And it's trying to get two municipalities to work towards it. We're, like Donna said, we're very willing in the legislature to provide the. Uh, the support for that to make it happen, but you have to get the local governments and the local populace uh, motivated to doing that. And then if we try and come up with a one-size-fits-all that comes from Harrisburg, 
pretty much every time we try that, we screw it up. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah, Donna. the one size fits all doesn't fit anyone. Go ahead, Representative no, Rigby. It, it, one of the things that was discussed with the group I'm with that, that they brought up, which should probably be considered at some point, too, is we have 501 school districts and 501 superintendents as opposed to 67 counties and 67 superintendents like they have in Maryland and Virginia. And I, I think maybe at some point that too is an avenue we need to look at um, as ways of reducing costs and saving taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the good news is we're down to 500. <laughs> yeah, we're chipping away. away. Manaka and, and Beaver joined. Okay. Boy, this is a quiet group. Rep Representative, can I, can I just comment real quick on, on that? Uh, so just real briefly, real briefly, we, we talked about we've traveled around the, the, the state here and spoke on these issues, and we, we did a policy tour in South Central Pennsylvania, and local uh, government came up there as well, more as it pertains to the liquor, liquor laws. Uh, and it, in, in following that, you know, trying to get – coordinate because I think some of the problem is, is that different municipalities have different sets of rules and and, and uh, the planning you know uh, planning codes and things are all different and different uh, people involved so what our county had, has done in Adams County has uh, the economic alliance their their economic development corporation has kind of tried to coordinate with townships within and municipalities within the county uh, to you know, try to come up, not with a comprehensive plan, but, but generally trying to, to kind of work together to get some um, predictability, because I think that's really what we're, we want here is, is some predictableness to, uh, I, I know the folks here at Sheets have de deal with municipalities, excuse me, across the state, and, and uh, everyone's unique and different, and every zoning hearing board's a, a different group of folks. So uh, our, our county's tried to, you know, through its economic alliance or development corporation, have tried to uh, consolidate that or get everybody on the same board and and to your point uh, representative Overlander kind of point out what are we doing in Harrisburg we we have passed some legislation I think that uh, helps uh, bring townships together we, we passed a, a piece of legislation that allowed task force again to be uh, inner inner uh, municipality agreements joint agreements when it pertains to police force uh, Supreme Court had overruled uh, uh, those cases so drug task force and things that uh, a lot of our municipalities work together on was kind of declared unconstitutional under a, a technicality. We quickly passed the legislation to allow uh, municipalities to enter into those kind of agreements again. I know Representative Schemmel out of Franklin County uh, works on some uh, inner inner municipal agreements uh, legislation out there. So there there is a legislation, not specifically to eliminate municipalities, but uh, to get them to collaborate through council of governments and things like that. Yeah, um, actually, I'd like to ask you folks something, because we need to hear from you on some things as well. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, since the late 1970s, our best export's been our working class kids. There's not a state in the United States that doesn't have a Steelers bar in it. And when I was talking with the Consul General of Canada about trying to get Continental One 219 finished here in Pennsylvania, I said, by the way, Madam Consul General, there are four in Toronto where you're from. She laughed because she knew two of them. My question to you is, seeing what we're seeing here, Ryan, with the, uh, the millennials and the, people, the young people you have here, and with what Representative Oberlander had us down at Urban Outfitters, and they were talking about the work ethic that uh, he's finding with the Indiana Distribution Center, that their Indiana County Distribution Center that they're talking about. You're doing things to draw people in. Uh, Urban's finding out what a treasure we have here, and you guys stayed here. I'd like to hear from you on what you think we could be doing statewide to try and, try and draw those people in who have left, as well as uh, keeping the people that we have here. You've, you've got a fantastic talent pool here. Um, yeah, so again, thank you for the, uh, for the compliments there. It's a really good question. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have the best answer for you for what, what we could collectively do together. But again, it um, goes back to the philosophy on, on how, we, how we manage our business and, and how we run this company. Um, 
you have more than 20,000 employees. Uh, 1,500 of them are located in this Claysburg campus, and this is obviously where we have the bulk of our corporate operations support. So any of our um, desk jobs, uh, technical experts, they're, they're housed here in, in Claysburg. And I'll be honest with you, it is, it is a challenge to recruit top talent from other places and to get them to come here. Uh, it certainly is a big motivator for us to build a facility like we're in. Uh, we were talking about Urban Outfitters and their facilities they have in Philadelphia. Um, I think what you're finding are, you know, top companies realize that you have got to invest in your workforce. And it means more than, you know, a good rate with nice benefits. It's, you know, you have to have a, a nice uh, lifestyle achievable for these people. So uh, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, it's certainly uh, a big reason as to it's part of why we do what we do. Um, you know, the other side of it is, um, so 20,000 employees, 18,000 of those are at store level. I won't have these stats exactly correct, but last I looked, two-thirds of them were younger people, and at the time, millennial generation. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of uh, part-timers, a lot of kids working their way through school. Um, and we don't, uh, for the industry, which turnover is usually, you know, not un uncommon to be running at 100%. Uh, we're, we're one of the better ones. We're, we're hanging about uh, 60%. Um, but still, you turn over 60% of 20,000 people every single year. That's a lot of money in training and, 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 uh, and, and turnover. But uh, it's a great question. Uh, I'm sure some, some business leaders from around the, the room here would have some perspective on it. But that's a, a little bit of, again, it's, 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 it's why we're doing what we're doing in part. Aside from leading with our values and doing the right thing, I mean, we've always, we've always done that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough environment, uh, and it's, 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 uh, it challenges you to do to do certain things so well and what we're seeing what we saw today uh, is going on up at uh, the the curve and the community involvement and that, that's one of the things you mentioned family values I, I was gone for about 12 years uh, before yeah. and it took me about four years of actively serving or searching before I found work back uh, back home uh, most of the people left because there wasn't work and there are a lot of people who would love to come back. And knowing that people or corporations like your own and others are uh, actively looking to create those types of better environments and get the word out about what the curve and the businesses that are involved with the curve and how they incorporate the, the amusement parks and everything else. We have a cultural uh, benefit here, but it's getting that word out, and then also I know we've got things to do from the state side on the infrastructure, but uh, be interested in hearing some other ideas on how we get that word out and get, like I said, bring I, our people home. I completely agree, and just, you know, more, more thinking out loud with you, you know, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but if you look at the millennial generation and Gen Z coming right behind them, you know, some of their shared um, characteristics are a very keen sense of community, right? Um, they absolutely care about the environment. Uh, and when they're looking at long-term careers, now granted, they're taking less the typical vert vertical path um, to retirement that previous generations did. They're bouncing around, they're more lateral and, and horizontal, but, um, you know, identifying companies who have shared sets of values. That, those are just hallmark characteristics, I think, of those younger generations. And again, the companies who are keen to that and can do a good job of selling that um, certainly help. Uh, yeah, again, there are great leaders from the community here. I mean, being able to position Claysburg, Blair County, as a, as a wonderful place to raise a family, a uh, great quality of life. If you are younger and you're looking for access to more urban outlets, I mean, we are incredibly accessible. Uh, and that's even, you know, here in Claysburg. So, uh, Really great question. I appreciate the, uh, the perspective. So. Thank you. I think one of the opportunities we have, uh, we're a general contractor and we do work all around the state, uh, in particular at a lot of universities and built a lot of science centers over the last 10 years at Lock Haven University, Clarion University, uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, obviously St. Francis, uh, Penn State, uh, you know, those sorts of schools. And I think that, you know, those schools present the opportunity where we have kids from around the country, a lot from Pennsylvania, but a lot from around the country coming, experiencing central Pennsylvania, uh, you know, 
liking the area, all these central Pennsylvania um, great institutions we have. And I think there's a, a big opportunity for those institutions, particularly the state ones, to partner with the businesses in the surrounding area and try to bring, you know, satellite offices here. And this information era we're in, uh, you know, we're not talking the Amazons of the world putting a, a uh, facility here in central Pennsylvania, but I think smaller campuses like Google's, I think, is done over in um, Pittsburgh and, and things like that can be centered in places like Center County along with Penn State University or in, in Indiana County with IUP and that there's a, you know, there, a lot of our best employees who maybe went to school, we just had a, a, a young woman who just came back to work for us, our director of pre-construction, who went to school at Penn State, moved away to Washington, spent about 10 to 15 years of her career uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, but when she wanted to raise her family, she came back to, to central Pennsylvania because of her roots here and going to school at Penn State and, you know, has a successful career with us now in this area that she she loved from when she was in school here. So I think that that's a story that we can tell, but I think bringing those industries from Silicon Valley or, or Washington, D.C., and, 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 you know, that's uh, Steve McKnight's uh, out there pounding the pavement every day to try to get those companies to see what you're saying about Urban Outfitters and, and this area has to offer. Yeah, come on, come on, come on over here. Yeah, we'll put yeah. you on deck. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Please, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, it's, it's an extremely relevant uh, conversation, this whole talent attraction thing. And I, I think what's important, you know, to keep in mind that behind every business, it's just people, right? I think we... We sometimes in the economic development business have put too much emphasis on the, the chasing the pharmaceutical company or chasing the whatever industry sector or using location quotients to data ourselves to death. Um, and, and maybe there was a time, you know, decades ago when uh, the, there were strong logistical issues as to why, you know, a particular investment was made in a different area. But, that's all changed and the technology platforms today have allowed the dispersion of, of companies to become more small, you know, smaller in nature, more nimble. Um, the startup environment right now is out of control, right? I mean, we can start up a business in our, on our iPhone. So, I mean, and you know, the next generation, when we look at, you know, my daughter's generation, which I'm calling the uh, virtual uh, generation, I mean, there's no boundaries. They're not even thinking of, of municipality boundary or where I mean they're just the world's completely flat you know at this point and so we we've changed our structure and I think the state um, you know is 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 doing that to a degree is to you know attract the people you know if you attract the people the people will bring the investment they'll start the business why do people locate anywhere it's because they love the place that they're you know operating in um, and uh, and it's it's sometimes as simple as that. So we've been making steps to make sure that taking steps that uh, uh, we tell the story of Central Pennsylvania. Here, you've got mountains. We've got four seasons. We have a period of what I call the gray period, which we're about to enter, and I think we leave it in sometime March or April. You know, um, you've got to love that stuff. You know, and the people that find themselves in it are going to come, and they're going to be able to set up operations and and join one of our uh you know 42 homegrown blair county companies most of them be, are behind me you know, at this point we have over 9,000 people employed and, and 42 companies that were born here in blair county so when you have when you really start to develop that type of a, a a stable economic base it's critically important but uh it's all about people it's all about talent and uh and how you uh, make that match happen joe Wow. How do you top that? I just don't. <laughs> just stop right I, I actually really only came up because I'm at the age where, you know, I was falling asleep. But, so, so I'm happy to, happy to be up here. I think this is the first time Joe and I have ever been in <laughs> Yeah, it. what time is it? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, there was a reference already made to our public policy committee, and I realize the public policy committee is, is one of our most effective uh, committees at the chamber, and one 
that I had the distinction of kicking Lou Schmidt off of uh, not so long ago when he, uh, he became an elected official. So, so that was one of the high points. But uh, I've been at, uh, at the chamber. That was a high point for me, too. Yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> uh, I've been at the chamber 23 years. And when I started, uh, I recall uh, it was a government affairs committee that we had at that time. And I recall somebody telling me, you know, Pennsylvania is a horrible place to do business. And that's why people aren't coming here. And that's why people are leaving. And I was in Harrisburg yesterday at a meeting at the state chamber with a number of my chamber colleagues. And somebody at that time mentioned when we were talking about workforce development, which is the topic that we talk about, you know, ad nauseum, uh, the one person in, in attendance at the meeting said, well, you have to remember, Pennsylvania is a horrible place to do business. And uh, I thought about that on my, on my way home, and, and I thought, you know, there are still, there are still th uh, issues that are so important that almost seem untouchable. And I know from a political standpoint, you know, uh, a lot of those issues kind of, you know, become contentious and just kind of die on the vine. And Matt Stuckey's question about, you know, too many municipalities, too many school districts, uh, I know that one of the reasons why Pennsylvania seems to have a difficult time attracting people is that, uh, is that we have the union mentality that, you know, we're, we're competing with states that are uh, right to work states. Uh, issues like prevailing wage are impacting uh, a lot of the, the businesses that are located here. Uh, I know that, that, that you people are in a, a very difficult position because you've got to be realistic in what you can accomplish. But those issues are ones now that almost seem like they're off the table forever. And those still are the issues where, when we look to create an environment where people will want to come here and live and work, and when we're losing people to other states and parts of the country as the result of, of circumstances like that, at what point do you say, you know what, we're, for better or worse, we're going to address this, and we're going to throw it out there and hope that uh, in creating the environment for people to want to live here and work here, uh, these can't be things that we just ignore and pretend that, you know, they'll go away at some point or, or we'll work around them. And so that's, you know, to me, that's what I've seen over the course of 23 years, where uh, even when the, the p politics of this lined up, where we had a Republican governor and a Republican Senate and a Republican House, we still couldn't get those things accomplished for whatever reasons. So uh, I'm not here to take you to task, but you wanted to know what the what the general feelings are about uh, why, especially now that we're facing workforce challenges, what is it that makes us think that our environment is one where people are going to, to come here and look for opportunities? Can I go back to sleep now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I don't have an answer for you, sir. But I do appreciate you sharing the, those concerns. I, yeah, just one second. So you had mentioned, Steve, 42 homegrown companies, 9,000 employees. Mm -hmm. And before I turn it over to, to Representative Struzzi, I want to just, um, through a show of hands, it won't be recorded, uh, how many of you are the homegrown companies and how many of you have openings right now? everyone and are you recruiting the same now as you did five years ago no 
because it's definitely a changing environment. And we've, we're have we seeing that as we go, crisscross the state. And I think that you're, you're, um, you're reacting to the, the demands of the workforce. Representative Struzzi. Thank you. Um, and as I mentioned, Joe and I are, are former colleagues in the world of chambers of commerce. And um, I know I totally get what you're saying, Joe. I, I think that you know, anyone who uh, is affiliated with business struggles with the same issues. Um, I, I do, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a freshman legislator as well as, you know, a number of the other uh, representatives that are up here today. Uh, I will say that having been uh, in Harrisburg for 10 months, though, it's been refreshing how much we have been able to accomplish this year. Um, we've passed a package of bills related to workforce development, related to education. We're working on the Energize PA package right now to, to sort of open Pennsylvania back up to the energy industry without trying to push them away. Um, the, the constant threat of additional taxes, um, all of those things that, that, that push business to, to our neighboring states, that push jobs to neighboring states. We, at least within our caucus, understand that. And so we have been working very hard this year to, to push bills as, as packages um, forward. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but we've, we've moved a lot of bills this year. I think it's into the 200s that we've sent through, um, you know, to the Senate, uh, hopefully to the governor. Now, I think you know where it's going to stop, but we have been working hard to do that. And, and that, that was one of the reasons that, that I ran for office, understanding from a business standpoint what the challenges are. Um, we, we know that our, our tax structures aren't conducive to attracting businesses. We understand, uh, you know, even, even getting into the property tax issues. I mean, that pushes people out of Pennsylvania. Um, a, a lot of those things um, weigh on all of us, but, but I, I do want to reassure you that there are people in Harrisburg, all of us sitting at this, in this panel right now, that are working hard to address those issues. Um, and and I, I think that Jim said it best, you know, when he talked about being in the majority. You know, we have the power right now to, to do those things to move Pennsylvania in the right direction. Can we get it over the final hurdle? I don't know. Um, but, but I want to reassure you that, you know, f coming from that Chamber of Commerce background, uh, we get it. And, and so we're working hard to, to push those agenda items forward. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And I apologize to everyone, but I have a kid that needs picked up from football back in Indiana, so I have to <laughs> leave a little early here. Thank you, Representative Struzzi. Representative Tesh. Getting into a little bit to the political weeds here. In, I've gone back and taken a look at rural Pennsylvania's voter turnout. We typically, and if you divide each of our leg legislative districts, we've got 63, 64,000 constituents. Mm -hmm. If you want to send a message to Harrisburg, we need to show up. Because typically, except the 2016 election was an anomaly, uh, typically rural Pennsylvania in the T shows up about 21 to uh, 20, 20, 21,000 in a presidential election year. 2016, it jumped to 24. If you look at Bucks, Montgomery, Chester County, Philadelphia County, they're turning out 33,000 roughly every single time to vote. Uh, when we show up, we're relevant. You know, Jefferson County's got one of the highest voter registrations in rural Pennsylvania, but I still go six or seven homes. We might have 85 to 90 percent on a recent uh, map that I'd seen registered to vote, but I still go six or seven homes between places where people vote. Now, if you want to start looking at uh, how the policy is being made on the executive branch level and that sort of thing, we need to start showing up strongly. Ryan, you'd mentioned about the family values and the values that we have here in central Pennsylvania, the work ethic that the folks down at uh, Urban Outfitters when we were in Philadelphia, they were talking about the work ethic that the plant or the, the facility hasn't even opened up in Indiana County. And the chief operating officer was just astounded at the work ethic of the people that he's hiring from here in our region. Uh, he commented about a guy got life flighted to Pittsburgh and he was fighting with the hospital to get back out and calling out to try and get help so he could get back to work the next day. 
And he looks around at the other people there and said, do you guys have anything like that in your area? He said, that's just an anecdote of what the workforce is like out here. So when it comes to the policy side of things, uh, I think it was the chamber actually did the survey. Business owners are the biggest determinant on turnout and where people are going to vote and how they're going to vote. You guys need to get that word out to your employees and start getting people out to vote. That will make a huge difference. But we've, and you've got to let your employees know why we, you, they need to vote that way. And let them know. I, when I was talking with the Consul General from Canada, she arranged for a meeting with me with the Transportation Minister of Canada which then he was going to meet with the Trump administration. They said we're going to have more, uh, or he was going to have a meeting with the Trump administration two weeks later. Got a phone call from the Mid-Atlantic Mid coordinator for, for, for the Trump administration, wanted to set up a meeting with our Secretary of Transportation and her. Four meetings got canceled. When we tried to set up the fifth one, the word that my legislative assistant received was, listen, we're not interested in new lane miles in western Pennsylvania. You have to get your people out to vote, and you have to inform them why. Continental One is supposed to run from Montreal to Miami. The largest unfinished portion of it is right here, right 219, running right down through this region. We need to get are people aware and you guys making your employees aware will increase the public awareness which is necessary but you guys have a lot of influence thank you representative dash representative gregory uh, th thank you uh, one of the things that um, i was just noticing is that uh, pennsylvania's a terrible place to do business yet everybody's looking for people to hire uh, we have more jobs than we have people for uh, we could follow South Carolina's lead when it comes to right to work, and we wouldn't have enough people to fill the jobs of all the companies that would come here. I'm just saying, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to congratulate uh, the economic development people, uh, as well as CareerLink, because I was just so encouraged to hear from uh, Steve McKnight that the, of the 300 22 jobs that uh, have been, folks that have been laid off in the last several months here in Blair County, all of them have been absorbed in this, in this, e in this economy. Um, and we have uh, the uh, CTC director here, Eric. Uh, Eric, if you just, just stand for a second and be recognized. Everybody know who Eric is? Everybody know Eric? <laughs> really? Does everybody know him? Because one of the one, one, one of the scariest <laughs> conversations I've had since I've been in office was a meeting with John Congressman Joyce, Senator Ward, and Representative Schmidt uh, about the stigma of hiring people in the trades. And uh, it happens with employers as well. And uh, what are we doing to uh, stop that? Uh, he has people in that, uh, in that system that are looking for jobs and don't have uh, opportunities because there's not enough money for it. Uh, more people are still going to colleges. You know, I, I don't know if everybody knows, but the NFIB uh, is re well represented here with Joe Harford. Does anybody know what the NFIB stands for? National Federation of Independent Businesses. Joe is, uh, is, is here, and I hope we get a chance to hear from him on a, a lot of subjects. One of these is, is uh, near and dear to him. But being able to recognize how we uh, need to alert our young people of the many opportunities that they have here that they don't have to leave here. First Energy will send you to college for two years, pay your debt, and then when you come out of college, you'll make 80000 before overtime. Okay. So what are we doing? Are we getting the word out there? Are we taking advantage of the resources that we have to make sure that Pennsylvania is a good place to do business? Uh, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I just want to say that it, the, the two caucuses that I've gotten involved in this year, one's a common sense caucus, one's an, uh, an economic growth caucus. They're all business people. Uh, you know, I was the CFO at Westinghouse Airbrake Good. And, all these people, they all understand what it takes to create jobs and to keep the economy grow, growing strong. And it's been refreshing, really, to see. I, I don't think there are any lawyers in our group, so not that that's... <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but it's, 
you know, there. I mean, it almost seems like it's a, a chamber in there, and and the 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 attitude, and the the desire, and they're they're all about thirty five people, and so I believe the strength is growing, and uh, you know, the economy of the last two years has has shown the results of what it can be. So I do believe there's going to be more and more going in that direction. Could I make just, sure. and I'll, yeah, I'll yield my chair, but um, <laughs> the, 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 one of the questions that started, you know, the, the conversation there with Ryan was the talent thing, and, the, and the, there's another important aspect of this talent attraction stuff, um, especially in the rural areas here, and that is um, housing. Uh, so, you know, uh, you start getting into this, you know, pulling folks from, from outside the area into our area, whether they're boomerangers or not, you know, lived here before, um, there's a housing expectation from some other markets and those that are nearby. And um, it's, it's a unique situation to a lot of the rural areas here in, in Pennsylvania uh, that were former industrial areas. Much of the housing was, was uh, uh, you know, railroad housing. So 80% uh, well, of our housing stock was built prior to 1940. Um, only recently, you know, we've added new stock um, and it's not on spec. So we, we have a very... Uh, cautious building environment here because of the demographic um, you know challenges so ABCD is an economic development organization recognizes this housing conundrum that we're in and um, are, are are trying to get the message out that you know we definitely want to encourage um, the private sector developers to get into this housing space and meet this latent demand that's underneath the, the top line numbers, you know, as the churn happens, retirements happen, and, you know, it creates that need uh, to bring folks in um, and, uh, and, to, and to have the right housing stock, you know, in place. So housing is a big, big talent attraction um, challenge for rural areas um, especially. So we're, we're open to having discussions about what, what kind of policy could be put into place, whether it's patient capital <laughs> Uh, program similar to the industrial development programs that could um, you know help bring some of that um, the more diverse housing into into the market area here so I'm gonna ask you a question about that um, one of the things that we've learned as we're traveling around is that that the Millennials and Generation Z don't necessarily have the same desire for home ownership that someone who is not of that generation uh, would would want so have has your community done sort of a study to figure out what it is you're looking for and then partnering with ABC to get there yes before you then look for the funding like new market tax credits and different yeah. things like that yeah we we've uh, the uh, the city of Altoona but the housing study really covered all of Blair was done a few years ago and it really points to the to, to this need for a diverse housing stock when I you know housing meaning rental lease you know apartments market rate, uh, uh, townhomes, so the things that represent the continuum for somebody moving into the area. So you just put yourself in, in the shoes of somebody moving in. They may say, I want to I want to lease this condo or apartment for a year, then I want a townhome, then I, maybe I'll get into a single family home, you know, if the time is mm -hmm. right. But um, we don't necessarily have that, you know, diversity of the housing. And most of that ends up becoming an adaptive reuse project where you're now getting into the urban core or a previously developed area, creates challenges, creates cost overruns, you know, again. And so we've been working to try to, you know, identify the patient capital stack that would be put into these projects to allow the private developer to do the project and say, look, if I don't have to pay this this portion of it back for a period of time until it's leased up or whatever that looks like, um, it, it, it would incentivize the private development to, to go and take on those projects and put that housing, you know, in place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Just one follow-up question. Do you guys have, like, extra money to throw at this problem? <laughs> we could probably come up with some ideas for Jim. <laughs> Go on. Well, actually, uh, we're... I think, at least from my standpoint, I'm looking at getting the government out of the way so you guys can actually take it on. Uh, we just, the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee uh, just came out with an audit showing that uh, DEP, uh, these Chapter 102 and 105 permits on development projects and that sort of thing, 
they're taking forever. And the auditors actually discovered that we give them three and a half percent increase in staff and we get a thousand fewer permits done as a result. Whereas the conservation districts which are out, which are out here working actively with the local businesses and the counties, uh, when we give them more money and more staff, we get more a greater result. So I'd like to see us get government out of the way so that you guys can actually do business. Yeah. Right, it sounds even better. All right, well, I'll leave it at that then. Then it will cost less. And then part of the conversation is to help you help us identify the issues so that maybe we can help you identify different programs or et cetera. And I know that um, you work very closely with your representatives and your senator. You have great representation here and uh, maybe there are opportunities there. For example, USDA is a great partner uh, with the state and a partner with housing, et cetera. That being said, I'll, okay. I'll turn it to you. I'm Joe Metzger. I'm from Logan Township. I'm a supervisor and I'm in the minority. Me and Matt Pacifico, I think, are the only two elected officials besides you folks. And I have four or five things, but I'm only going to do one because the rest of them are not going to happen tomorrow and I don't think it'll ever happen. Because lately we've been hammered, Logan Township and all, all municipalities in Blair County, with the sediment removal of the streams. Um, we have the um, Rate, one issue I like, which we is an unfunded mandate. That's just another unfunded mandate. And I, I just wonder sometimes, as we all do, when you folks in Harrisburg pass laws or push something down to municipalities, do you understand the burden that you put on the folks? I mean, I would, attended a seminar on this sentiment removal, and a recommendation was, well, just pass it on to your consumers. Well, <laughs> You know, that's not the way it works. If you're gonna tell us to do something, at least fund it. But my, my, I think the thing in, in the prevailing wage was brought up, I agree with that, that that's, a, that's a big thing. Um, the thing that I think you can do easily, maybe, not easily, because legislatures don't do anything easily, we all understand that, is the radar for local police. I mean, I don't think there's any place you can go in this Commonwealth you won't hear a complaint about speeding. My sister lives in Norristown. She said it's nuts down there. I mean, even the township, uh, we always get phone calls. If I'm out and about any place, people come in, what are you gonna do about speeding? Um, and then they'll give me license plates numbers and I'll pass it on to the chief and, and tell them the area and then they'll get one or two. But I think the local police forces strongly would welcome if you folks would finally pass radar for local municipalities. We don't want it to be a cash cow. We just want to control those idiots that fly. I live in Homer's Gap, which is a out, we call it a farm area. People, the speed limit's 25. There's no one that goes 25. There's no one that goes 35. Most of the speed in the morning, we get the paper, it's 50 or 60. Good thing I have a gated house because my dog would not last two, Two, two mornings. So I'm just urging you, asking you, requesting you, begging you, or whatever the word is. Address that, please, for the for the local municipalities. Yes, sir. I'll address that as a, a former police chief in a small municipality, and everybody thinks it's a money maker for the police departments. So what you don't understand is the municipality gets one half of what that fine is. The rest of that money goes to the state and the county. It actually cost me money to send an officer to a hearing because I've got to pay him a minimum of two hours. That doesn't even cover what the fine is that we get back. And so for folks that say the radar is no good and it's just a money maker for the departments, believe me, we don't make any money um, writing speeding tickets or stop sign violations. Those, for what we get, half of that fine money, which is the fine, not all the additional cost, it cost me every time one of my officers would go to a hearing. Um, I believe we need them. Look, everybody sees the white lines down and we know we got to slow down in these certain areas. And we've got a lot of areas in my area where there's a lot of kids playing. Uh, I don't understand why local police cannot use radar. I, I've been a big proponent of it for years. Uh, Barry, you might want to address it as a former state trooper and what your thoughts are, but I, I, I don't know why we're not using it. 
I, I, since you're a police chief, I think you would agree that you could probably, depend on your area how big it is, Logan Township could probably dedicate one officer 24-7, 365 days a year, just on speed control. And he'd have to different areas. I'll give you an example. We had, uh, when, a few years ago, we had a representative come from one of our areas, of, which, again, was speeding. And they had maybe 15, 20 people there. And they had a, a, a guy that did the spokesman for them. And he went on and everything, and, they, and the police chief said, okay, what we'll do, we'll send our sign down, the sign will post the speed limits for two weeks, and then we'll remove it, and then at some point we'll send an officer down there to check for the speeding. Well, you know what happened. The first day they set up the speed, they pulled someone over. I give you one guess who it was. The representative, the spokesman. And what they found out, the people are doing most of the speeding are the people that live in the area. So uh, if you can do it, fine. I'm, and you'll get, if it takes a letter from Logan Township and the city of Altona, I'm sure we'll join in. I would think, I can't speak for Matt. Um, but I think that's something desperately needed by the local police. That's Representative it. Schmidt. The other ones you can't deal with now, I mean, we, we just go back and forth the unfunded mandates. I mean, that's a big bugaboo of mine. It will be the day I die, but it's, it's just going to happen. I'll turn it over to Representative Schmidt. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to address a comment that was made, uh, made earlier, actually it was a question. Somebody asked if we had money laying around. Uh, we should never have too much money, the legislature. If we have money laying around, that's because your taxes are too high. Uh, so I don't want us ever to have money laying around. Uh, we should have as, as much money as we need to do our jobs, but no more than that. As far as local radar goes, that's something, of course, that's been, uh, there have been bills introduced for a number of, of sessions now, and there are a number of bills out there on local radar in the Senate and in the House. Um, some better than others. And, and I will tell you this, that everything in Harrisburg begins with a conversation. And there are conversations being held about local radar. I can tell you that the majority chair of the Transportation Committee, which I serve on, Tim Hennessy, and the minority chair, Mike Carroll, both have expressed um, a receptivity to, to local radar um, that I don't think they, those positions have uh, expressed before in the, in the past. The problem with local radar is, is kind of like the problem with consolidation. Uh, if we pack, pass a bill and it allows local radar, uh, when somebody gets a ticket in Altoona for a couple hundred bucks, they're not going to be going to the police complaint. They're going to come up with pitchforks and tr torches to my office saying, you let these guys give me a ticket for $200 because you let them use radar. So, and that's, that's the practical consideration. I think we will see something in the near future in terms of local radar. Uh, it's going to be, it's obviously going to be a compromise. I think that the, at least the people on the Transportation Committee want to make sure that anything that passes in terms of local radar uh, is really safety oriented and not revenue generating okay. oriented for the lo local municipality. And that's, I think that's always been the, hey look, Pennsylvania is the only state in the United States that doesn't allow local radar. So, well, you know. Henry, I would tell that bird to look in the mirror if he wants to see who was responsible for him getting a ticket. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And the well, other thing is... Hey, look, doesn't it matter. It doesn't matter who's responsible. Well, They're going to come to me. I, I've been requested by the supervisors of Logan to tell the legislatures our last money tree died. <laughs> we don't have another money tree to go get that extra three or $400,000 when you send these unfunded mandates down. We try to regrow it, but it just won't grow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Thank sir. you very much. Go ahead, Representative Dash. Joe, I'd just like to answer uh, one thing you brought up about the unfunded mandates and the regulations. You know, uh, from the time of Woodrow Wilson, uh, when he had this favorite book called uh, Philip Drew Administrator, it's been just over 100 years, he convinced the federal legislature to write broad, sweeping language for the bills and turn the uh, ability to write the regulations that become the law, write the fees and the fines, then build enforcement arms and as well as uh, miniature judiciary arms. That was never meant to be in our Republican form of government. Uh, very quickly, the legislature learned and the states soon followed that they could write this stuff and then sit back and say, that's not what I voted for, and then start arguing separation of powers. Uh, the 
very quickly they became a very easy position to be in because you didn't, nobody was accountable. You couldn't hold anybody accountable. We need to get back to the point where the laws are actually being written by the legislature. Everything that has to do with what becomes law, the use of force against the people, either compelling them to do something or not to do something. That's what we do. And unfortunately, we've delegated that. We've abrogated the responsibility. And there are a group of us, uh, Representative Brooks mentioned the Common Sense Caucus. We're working to try and get that transparency back. Torin uh, brought up uh, some of the bills that we've passed, and so did uh, Representative Struzzi. We are working to try and tighten that back down, but it's going to take, it's, it, we've, it's taken us 100 years to get to this point where there is no accountability. It's, gonna, it's like turning an aircraft carrier or a super tanker. You can turn that little rudder, but it's going to take a while to get it turned. It's not going to turn on a dime and give you five cents change. But that's a direction this state and this nation needs to start to take. Uh, Ryan, your, your business, when Amy had us on the tour upstairs, she was talking about <clears throat> the small number of people that you actually have working here as it relates to having a 20,000 uh, employees. And she had said that it's getting the, the most effective use out to the people that you're running at the stores, the customers. Unfortunately, in government, we don't do that. We tend to build these bureaucracies up, and then the money it's supposed to get out to our health and human services uh, people in the field, it's not getting there. It's getting bottled up in $160,000, $180,000 jobs down in, Phil uh, in Harrisburg and in the regional offices. That's the change that we need to start taking. But uh, as Bob said, we've got people in there that are actually working towards this. And all these new people that we've had come in over the last eight, 10 years, that's the change that you're starting to see. We're, we're, there are a bunch of us that are taking a stand. And you guys need to encourage that in the business community so that you can have somebody you can actually hold accountable whenever those unfunded mandates, whether it's in the, uh, the municipal governments or in business, you've got to have somebody you can actually hold accountable every two years. You can kick them out if they're writing stuff that, and passing stuff that's actually hurting you. Unfortunately, right now, most of the things that are hurting you are being done by regulations by unaccountable bureaucrats. Thank you. That's a great point. And I was going to uh, mention that it really is very, very few times is it actual legislation, it's regulation that um, is being generated by bureaucrats. Uh, with that, I know that we're coming to our closing point. Does anybody else want to share? Yeah, c come on up, come on up. I'm not rushing anyone. I just want to let you know we're getting to the, we're getting close. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, my name is Sean McClanahan. I'm with McClanahan Corporation <clears throat> in uh, Hollidaysburg. And I know uh, Representative Gregory is the only one that I know up here. So um, for the sake of that, our company is an old line manufacturing company. We primarily make equipment for the mining and agricultural industry. We are a global corporation. Our headquarters are here in Hollidaysburg. Um, and at this location, we have close to 300 employees in, uh, in Hollidaysburg. And, and circling back to the job side of it, you know, I, and I agree with probably Steve, um, what he said that the flat earthers out there at the moment with in terms of jobs, we have seen that um, when trying to recruit employees for skilled positions and key positions, um, whether that be in an office environment with IT or out in the manufacturing environment uh, for, for critical skills, uh, we are tending to hire them wherever they are. Um, and I, and I, I think this particular area, having been born and raised here, I'm very proud of this area, obviously, um, we see a lot of the boomerangs. They, they leave and they come back. And it's the parents or grandparents that are giving them the resumes for the engineers that we hire or the other positions that we hire. Um, so there, it is a, a circular approach where you sort of have to let them go for a while. And, and hope that they can come back because this particular area is a fantastic environment to raise a family. And I think many of our employees are here because of that. They want to raise a family in this environment. Um, but my, my point of the job side of it is, and what we've had to do, is really 
think outside of uh, our traditional hiring process and the way we've done that over the years. Again, we hire wherever that position is. Uh, we have a, a, a um, office in Nashville, Tennessee, because that tends to attract a lot of uh, young workforce that want to live there for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I think from a Pennsylvania perspective, what I'd like to see from, from a government help would be uh, more for the, for the government to entice the schools to work with businesses. And we have lots of opportunities that we can, we can provide, uh, job shadowing, career shadowing, um, and, and developing these skills for young workers as they're coming out of school to give them an understanding of what it means for supply chain management and what it means for engineering and giving them real world examples. And we typically hire about 12 uh, summer interns a year. Uh, they're paid positions. Uh, we, we like to do as much uh, career shadowing and job shadowing as we can, but we seem to have a hang up with the school districts at times where they don't have a, um, a vehicle that will allow them to come out as frequently as they need to be more than just two hours in one particular year. Uh, you, you really can't give a, a student any kind of appreciation for what a skill it's going to take and what a, what a career could be with only two hours of, of career shadowing. So we would like to see where, um, where, where the environment would be more um, working with business to provide them far more flexible time and far more hours where they can come out and work in the business environment. Um, so if, and, and from the other side from the, the, the trades, um, and I know we hopefully we the dialogue over the last 10 years has drifted more towards you don't have to go to college. You don't have to go to college. Uh, and I hope to continue to hear that uh, because we have machinists that would start with us and make $100,000 a year, um, no problem. So it's, it, it we, but they're, they're few and far between because the skill sets aren't being taught and they aren't being leveraged, whereas every kid that has a really good head on his shoulders is, has to become an engineer or has to become some super phenomenal trained person rather than they like to work with their hands, they want to stay local, we can provide a good living and a, and a good uh, living wage. So um, there's lots of opportunities there beyond just the high ends of school. So. At, for what it's worth, that's my two cents of trying to see if we can leverage some way between the government allowing school districts to help uh, businesses provide more opportunities for, for, for the kids. So with that, I'll yield back the rest of my time. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we have heard that repeatedly, and that's part of our jobs package, was to create that connection with our schools. Um, I will tell you that... I was just with my career in technical education school. Uh, we're trying to partner them with their with our local businesses so that our kiddos know what's available. Because if you've never been in there, you've never been behind that gate, you don't know what's happening there. And I do know that uh, Representative Tobash, um, he had a bill that would partner teachers with their Act 48 credits, I think it's called, where they could actually go to that business. So having this kind of opportunities is uh, really good for everyone involved and I appreciate your comments. You go ahead, Representative Eckert. You know, this this topic to me is uh, something that I've, you know, passionate about, workforce development uh, in my area, in, in Adams County specifically, uh, and over in York County in the Hanover area. In fact, this week we just passed a piece of legislation that deals with exactly what you're talking about in encouraging apprenticeship programs in our high schools. Uh, what what happened in in our local community was that local business it's it's heavily manufacturing driven it's a pretty heavy manufacturing area and lo local manufacturers realized they needed machinists they needed welders they needed uh, mechatronics uh, folks they they so they they got together with their chamber of commerce and 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 their local school districts and and they all kind of collaborated and and really what happened there is that the local businesses put some skin in the game and invested heavily uh, in our local school districts uh, in the infrastructure to build up these career and technical centers within you know these public education settings that kind of redefine education that uh, and modernize education that the four-year schools aren't aren't necessarily the only thing that you, that, that you need to promote so the schools in our area are, are definitely changing and a lot of that had to do with the business community approaching the school district and investing uh, in the schools, uh, you know, for example, in, in 
uh, New Oxford School District. Uh, there's two million dollars worth of inv- all the equipment that went into it welding you know the machines itself was all invested or donated from private industry and with the idea that you're going to get kids interested in the trades or get it, kids interested in manufacturing which is a pipeline then right out to the school so I think the if the business community is willing to uh, let's face it money money's money talks and I think that's that that works in our that worked in our community where the business is invested in our schools and uh, it was a win-win for, for both sides Uh, one of the things that we discussed, and I'm looking at Richard, is because uh, we discussed specifically what uh, Torin just suggested, Eric, if you recall, uh, an Operation Our Town approach to being able to fund these kinds of opportunities for businesses to be able to attract schools into that mindset of teaching to, teaching to the skills. Uh, Operation Our Town's been a great thing. Uh, it's brought a lot of businesses together. Uh, businesses coming together works in Blair County, this might be another suggestion, another way of looking at it, another way of approaching exactly what Torin just talked about. All right, I don't want to scare anyone off, so if someone wants to speak, please feel free. Yeah, come on up. My name is Joe Hartford. I'm with Reclamere. Um, Jim, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, this may seem like a, a strange connection to talk about criminal justice reform and workforce education and development in the Commonwealth, but for many of you and for all of us, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, we have approximately 56,000 people that are in the criminal justice system in Pennsylvania alone. About 16,500 will get out of prison this year and an annualized cost of $45,000 a head. I'm not great at math, use your phone. Um, what's the point? Like why, do, why, why would somebody in business care about that? Because it's a huge tax burden. It's a huge part of our general fund budget, for goodness sake. I think everybody in this room probably already knows that. But the, the real scary part is that of that 16,500 that will get released from prison this year in Pennsylvania, about 60% will be back in prison in three years from now. 60% of that number will be back in prison, an annualized cost of $45,000 a head. That's huge. And they're going back in for technical violations. They're not going back in because they're mass shooters. They're not going back in because they're drug lords and drug czars. They're going back in for technical violations in many cases. Now, I am not here at all to say on the record that I believe that the same way the Dukakis looked at it, we should just simply let everybody out of prison for goodness sake. You break the law. You pay the fine, you have to deal with your punishment. That's a separate, sentencing is a different conversation altogether. The reality of where we are today, however, is that economically, we are burdened significantly by this challenge. We have to figure out how a guy who lives in Huntington County that gets out of prison after, after two years for a, heroin, for a heroin offense, who lives in Huntington County whose parole officer is in Altoona, can't get his driver's license back for two years, gets from Huntington to Altoona for his parole hearing. Should he see his parole officer? He absolutely should see his parole officer. That's his responsibility. We have technology. They're called computers. They're wonderful things. We have this funky thing on our phone called FaceTime. It's another really unbelievable use of technology. The reality is that criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania has to be in the conversation because if it's not we're just simply going to do what we've always done and get what we've always gotten right so for me when i take a look at the men and women that are in prisons today when we take a look at statistics and research the reality is that they have some of the highest employee engagement in the workforce they have the least number of workplace accidents and their ability to really remain faithful in a job is high so the opportunity to hire those folks is clear. The challenge we have in Pennsylvania is also around licensing. So I think we're beginning to, to kind of wrestle with licensing. But to give you an example, for a long time, we said to men, well, you should become a barber. You should go into, into, the, into the system and become a barber. It's a good job, right? You get out. You're not allowed to get a license in Pennsylvania if you're a convicted felon as a barber. That is mildly insane. 
Okay? So my point to all of this is that there is a population of folks out there that we can get training, we can get them back in the workforce, and something I really like when people pay taxes. I don't want them to, I don't want to be paying $45,000 a year to keep them in a box. I want them to get a job, go back with their family, buy a car, rent an apartment, live here in Altoona, and pay taxes. That's the reality of what I'm looking at in workforce education and development as it pertains to incarceration in Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments, and I understand that you are a doctor with a PhD in criminal justice reform. Yes, ma'am. My husband is a superintendent at SEI Forest, and my daughter is a, a probation officer. So we have a They're vested interest <laughs> in, um, in the system. I will tell you that now is the absolute best time in my 11 years in the legislature where you have both Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, with the administration and others working on common sense criminal justice reform, something that we have not seen before. And things that you just mentioned about licensing, I think are on the table. Uh, being able to cross county lines is on the table. Uh, there have been a number of reforms that we've already passed, and I believe that you'll continue to see that. And I hope that you are engaged in some way with that process with us. I am, through the DOC. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because the DOC is 100% in with all of us. When I say the administration, that is Secretary Wetzel and friends. I know you want to say something, Representative Dush. <laughs> I've also got 16 years in the Department of Corrections. I do have some issues with the way I, most of, about 95% of what you were talking about, I absolutely agree with. There are a couple things with uh, the technical parole violators and others. A lot of times what you're finding out, the guys who are coming back with uh, what we call TPVs, technical parole violators versus convicted parole violators. Uh, those technical issues have to do with for instance, just taking off and going out of state without reporting it and getting clearance from their parole, parole officer, that's indicative of some other issues as it relates to how that person is going to relate to society. Sending people back for those kinds of things uh, and for having uh, possession, a lot of the, uh, they don't get convicted for it, they just get found right. to be in possession or have it in their urines that they've been on drugs. The problem the department has is we are, we're not doing treatment at the front end and then making them go through uh, their period of incarceration, having to live by the rules. Unfortunately, the treatment that is being done is usually being done at the back end the last six months or so. These guys can act up and do whatever they want for two, three, four, five, nine years, they get close, then they start going through all the treatment programs, they'll dot the I's, cross the T's, because they know exactly what to say and what to do. And the programs are pretty much canned, so they know what they have to do. They can, they can get by for six months or something, and then we've also got a problem with we're uh, reducing those misconducts in the last, from class one misconducts down to class twos, which the class ones are automatically disqualifiers. <clears throat> and unfortunately, to get them out the door, we're seeing an awful lot of the program review committees knocking them down. They come out into society and they, don't, they, they haven't built up a couple years of learning how to live by rules in a civilized society. So those are some of the things, the shortfalls that the department's having. Uh, I would like to see us start shifting that treatment towards the front end so that when they do get there, because if they're, they, they do, where Representative Oberlander's uh, husband is working, they actually have one of the better programs. Whenever the, a person ends up down in the hole, uh, when they come out, there's a step-down unit. They have to abide by the rules. If they act up, they go back, and then they, can, they just keep having to work it until they can f get back out in the general pop. That doesn't happen at most of the institutions, unfortunately. So uh, it is a, con for a conversation that we do need to have because the guys, I hated seeing them coming back. I, the one, of the, one of the guys that we had go out that 
I met his mother down in Philadelphia, and she, he was locked up, and uh, so was his wife. So mom, or his mom is watching the grandkids. And he went down to Virginia. He got permission from the parole officer, but when he came back, he got pulled over for speeding and used a false name. He said, force a habit. He said, I just did. And in Virginia, they don't, he got convicted for that because they don't play that game if you use a false name with a trooper. So there are some things that you, we have to address and make sure that we're doing things to make sure that they are able to adapt and work in society. We also need to do increase the uh, uh, corrections industries, start getting them the soft skills and then teaching them how to actually do work and show up for work every day. Unfortunately, we're not doing that. Thank you. Well, thank you all for, number one, coming today. Thank you for your interaction and your uh, really gracious attention. We appreciate hearing from you. I know that you know how to get a hold of these two individuals and Senator Ward. Please give her our best. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you very much.